Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm super duper excited to be here to talk about 2020 virtual event trends. And I realize 2020 is pretty much over now at this point. So we want to dive in this content. I'm going to cover a little bit of the 2020 stuff, but you guys, better yet, I'm going to give you guys a sneak peek into my guide that I'm building for 2021 trends. It's not done yet, but you're going to get a glimpse into my mind and what it's looking like uh, right here, fresh, exclusively at Vent Tech Live. So, um, let's go ahead and kick on over to uh, the, 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 the screen and uh, show everybody what we got going on. So uh, when it comes to 2020 event trends, right, I do this whole presentation. Every year I write like the big, huge uh, trends guide for the year. Well, you know, the next one's coming up. But you might be thinking to yourself, like, who's this Will Curran guy? So my name's Will Curran. I'm probably the fastest person you'll ever see talk in your entire life. So we're going to try to condense an hour and a half worth of content into... 30 minutes or less than that, 15 minutes, so I can answer all of your questions along the entire way. So for, for everyone who kind of has never heard me, I'm what they call an influencer. I you know, have three podcasts, the Event Tech Podcast, the Event Icon Show, where we interview icons of the events industry, and Event Brew. And some of you guys who do know me might have seen uh, the, the, the episode we did on Event Brew called Event Trends Reports, Is It Time to Go? And in that episode, I actually argue why these 2020 event trends guides really need to die and that they're actually all really terrible. So why does the guy who argues that they need to die and why they're terrible giving a presentation on event trends? Well, that's because this is not the event trends report that you are looking for. I'll repeat that again. This is not the event trends presentation that you're looking for. You know, we're not going to be talking about how VR, you know, about the coolest furniture trends. We're not going to be talking about Pantone color of the year. Instead, we're going to be, if you want to get all that, you can go check out our podcast, Event Icons. We do a whole episode on the trends, design, language, all that sort of stuff when it comes to events. But instead, what I want to talk about is strategy and getting super strategic with your events rather than getting stuck in that design or execution phase. Instead, talk about that next level. You can learn all about this. I have a video series called Whiteboard Wednesday where I take complex event topics and break them down onto a, a whiteboard so everyone simply can understand them. One of which it talks about this idea about how the, a design, execution, and strategy all come together to make great events. By the way, if I'm going super fast and you want to get links to all this sort of stuff, um, follow me on Twitter. Uh, at it's Will Curran, um, or I'm sure if you hashtag Event Tech Live, you'll find my tweet I just sent out. But I'll post a Google Doc after this with the links to all these articles, all of the podcasts, everything like that, all in one place. Uh, in fact, to make this even better for you guys, to show you guys this is 100% live, since uh, sometimes you have to pre record content in the virtual space, I'm going to go ahead and tweet out this link right now. So then that way you guys can uh, start collaborating inside this doc right now. How does that sound? So again, follow me on Twitter. It's Will Curran or just search hashtag event tech live. And I'm going to post out this link right now for everyone to uh, get into. So, all right. That link is live with all the Google doc goodness that you could ever do. It's a doc that you can add links into, take notes in, all that sort of stuff. So, all right. So let's start to get strategic. And, you know, I could sit here and break through all the different trends that we had for 2020. In fact, this is all the trends that we settled in for the 2020s. But I want to talk to you guys about 2021 and give you guys all of the exciting 2021 stuff. So when it comes to everything, event trends related guide and in depth. So instead of uh, doing boring PowerPoint, how about you guys say I write and design these, this content live with you guys? Does that sound good? Make some noise in the chat if you think that sounds good. So 
let's talk about 2021 trends guides. So the first thing that people always want to talk about is that it comes to hybrid events and hybrid events is the future and it's going to be everything. Well, we're talking about hybrid events right now when most of the country is still in a rapid pandemic. There's in states where I'm at, we still have states that are like surging in cases. This is, we're, we're a long way off. And, you know, when it comes to things like, for example, hybrid events, people want to know the number one question is when will we come back? That's the biggest question. When are we going to be back? When are we going to be doing hybrid events? When are we going to be doing in-person experiences? That's like the biggest trend everyone wants to talk about. What I'm going to plead you to do is instead of looking at event professionals like Will Curran to know when are we coming back for events, instead who you need to be listening to is the scientists and the medical professionals in the entire world. I mean, guys, like, the, the fact that event professionals are the ones discussing when events are going to come back, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, right? It has to be the medical professionals and the scientists who tell us when it's safe. And when that does happen, there's going to be a very, very interesting thing that happens. There's kind of this fork that happens within the events industry. On one side, you have, you know, vac things like a vaccine, right? You have things like um, proper... Um, you know, regulations, let's put proper reg, you know, also attendee trust, right? All these things have to happen for hybrid events to come back or to start happening again, right? So we have to have to kind of like this, this, uh, this check marks along the entire way for each one of these items. And then, you know, everything's going to be hybrid, right? And, you know, if you don't know what hybrid is or anything like that, I define hybrid as the melding between in-person and virtual 100%. Not the separate side of things, but the true melding of it together. So that's when the hybrid's going to happen. On the other side of things, you have, let's put it as a big no. None of this happens, right? We don't get vaccines. We don't have attendee trust. We don't have the proper regulations. This is when we're going to be playing in the, the virtual world a lot longer. And it's important to know that because everyone wants to jump to the new and hot, exciting hybrid world. But really, we should be focusing also on the virtual world, right? We just started doing virtual, right? Like, think about where we were in March and how far we've come as an industry. It has totally changed and technologies have improved. But we have to be prepared to keep focusing and working on virtual because if none of these things happen, we're going to still be over here and we can't get our eyes on the shiny object and away from the thing that we might be spending a lot more time in. Another important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we think of these as like these perfect straight lines, right? We're going to, you know, we, we're going to get a vaccine. Then, you know, we get proper regulation. Then we get attendee trust and boom, we're at hybrid. That's not what this is going to look like. This is path is going to look more like, Whoa, we got a vaccine. Oh, no, that didn't quite work. People still getting sick. Oh, no, we got the we, we uh, got a, another vaccine. Okay, cool. We got proper regulation. Oh, some venues are not doing proper regulation. It's going to be this crazy, wild mess before we finally arrive at a perfect hybrid world. So that's something to keep in mind is this is going to be messy. It's going to need a lot of flexibility. And us as event professionals be, need to be ready for that. So, all right. So now that we've talked a little bit about, you know, when, when are events going to come back? Probably the biggest trend. I want to talk about some hyper-specific couple concepts that are going to make its way into our trends guide potentially that I'm starting to see when it comes to events. And then I want to jump into Q&A because you guys have lots of questions about what's going to be the next big thing, and I want to answer all those questions. So let's talk about a couple of the, the, the major trends that I'm seeing. So first major trend relates to speakers. I mainly run in the world of corporate events and, you know, conferences and meetings and things like that. So a lot of my trends lean towards that sort of thing. But you can feel free to shift this towards music or artist or entertainment on here. But one of the biggest things that I see that we're missing is related to speakers. And that is improved speaker, let's call this management or training or whatever it may be. Support when it comes to it. When we went into this. We all thought to ourselves, yeah, speakers, whoa, this is great. We don't have to pay them to fly in. You know, they can present from home. Then very, very quickly, everyone was like, wow, there are some speakers who are just not good at virtual. Let's just not have them speak, right? 
And then we were like, okay, well, we have to have some people speak, you know, especially for some of those conferences, like at medical conferences, lawyer conferences, things like that. Like these people aren't professional speakers, but they still have content they have to get out. Well, what ends up happening is that we realize that, man, we can't just leave speakers to say, you're, you're speaking, go get a mic, go get the nice camera that autofocuses really quick, get the lighting kit, all those things like that, right? We, we lean so much on our speakers to do everything. Well, that might need a change because what we're seeing is that speakers are making or breaking the content. So what we need to do as an industry is figure out how to do this better. Whether if as an industry, we're going to decide that the onus is on the speakers. Well, then we need to start, you know, maybe paying our speakers a little bit more money so they can afford to buy nice equipment, all those things like that. Right. Maybe, um, you know, hiring only professional speakers. So then that way you get the right setup. But if we're deciding that, Hey, we're going to still have, you know, maybe amateur or not necessarily the most professional speakers go, well, we need to do things like, for example, um, get them things like a microphone. We need to be able to figure out things like training, draw like a whiteboard over here with a dude in front of it training to show, Hey, how does this all work? But a lot of what we've been doing is leaning on the speakers to figure this out and saying, Oh, too bad. So sad. When reality, think about an in-person event and how it used to be. Speakers showed up, they got handed a clicker, they handed you a thumb drive with the presentation, they did their content, they walked off stage. It was very white glove. Well, this improved speaker management trend that I'm going to start to see over this next year is really going to change things. So, all right, that's one of my major trends. Next major trend that I'm going to have is actually related to attendee experiences. Let's call this attendee experience on here. Woo! How are you guys doing out there? You guys having a good time? All right. Attendee experience. Well, before all, you know, the pandemic hit on, you know what the number one trend that everyone loved to talk about but was never happening? It was two letters, VR. Everyone loved talking about VR. Oh, it's going to be the year of VR. It's going to be huge. I mean, we were predicting that VR was going to start to take off on a consumer route this next year, um, but like not really hit the events industry. Well, now, because everything's gone 100% digital, VR is 100% in the front, right? Because it's such a unique experience. It gives us crazy experience no one else has had before. People are buying up headsets like left and right. The Oculus Quest dropped in the last couple months. Super duper great headset that's super inexpensive. Well, I don't want to talk about like VR as in terms of an attendee experience. But what I think is happening in these next you know, coming months is that people have been feeling Zoom fatigue and presentation fatigue for so long. Like, right, like we've been feeling Zoom fatigue since April. Well, everyone's like, okay, well, we need to like make this experience better. And what's happening is they realize like, okay, well, we have to do things like we're doing here. We do these, these awesome setups where there's like picture in picture and shout outs, you know, to the First Sight Media team for doing all the awesome uh, audio visual and production work on this. But this helps a ton in making it feel not like a Zoom meeting but it only goes so far, right? You still feel like even though I'm using a whiteboard, I'm super high energy, I can still be kind of fatiguing. Shouts to everybody who's checking their emails right now. I know you're doing it, right? But how do we prevent this? How do we create those insanely amazing experiences that we had with in-person events? Well, that's where we need to level up the attendee experience. So here's a prediction I have. I think that more planners are going to be figuring out how to use VR. They're going to say, let's do stuff in VR chat. Let's figure out how to build a custom app if we have the budget. Let's, um, let's play around with this idea that, hey, we'll do some content, but then we're going to also have some games in virtual reality so you can mix it up. But here's a simpler idea, right? VR is very expensive to design and code in and do all that sort of stuff, but there's a very, very simple piece of hardware that could potentially level up our experiences, and it's called the TV, right? People are like, how many people out there are actually watching this presentation on their TV? But TVs lack one thing. They're just one way. We're like, you're just absorbing the content, no, you know, everything like that. But what if instead we could touch the display and interact with the content? Then you throw a camera on top and boom, you have like a self-sustaining experience for someone to interact when it comes to your event. I think that we're going to see touch screens and like, you know, smart boards and, you know, the Surface Hub and the Vibe board become the next level of hardware for virtual events. Platforms are going to figure out a way to make it so you can drag and drop notes, that you can do more whiteboarding sessions together, 
Wouldn't it be great if I could share my screen right now with you? You could grab your pen and draw along with me, highlight things, you know, sketch it out, do all that sort of stuff, drop in pictures and screenshots. Well, it doesn't, it sounds expensive and it sounds crazy, but what if I told you that one of these boards, you can get a touchscreen board with a pen for $3,000. So like, what does that break down to? 4,000 pounds or so. So, um, you get these displays. They're not that expensive. I know conferences where I spent more than $3,000 to attend one conference. And that was like a three or four day experience. What if instead you could ship all your attendees one of these displays and then host, you know, maybe make the ticket price $5,000. You send them a $3,000 display and that's their way they attend the event. They roll it into their living room. They interact with every, and everyone's got it with the camera on top and interacting. Wouldn't that be really cool? Well, that's starting to talk about leveling up the attendee experience and taking it away from being this one-way experience, being a broadcast, and turning it into a two-way collaborative experience all day long. All right. Last but not least, I have one last trend I'll give for you guys to be thinking about, and then we're going to jump into some Q&A, and that is data security. I could talk about this one for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. But guys, if you don't know anything about data security, data protection, this is mainly for my US audience. All of my homies over in Europe, you guys are crushing it because you guys have been doing this for a long period of time. But think about it. If you don't understand different technologies, what can cause a data leak, if you don't have insurance on your company for you know, data protection, if you do not have a data protection officer within your company, you need to do it. This is the year. It's no longer an excuse to say, oh, you know what? I'll worry about it next year. I'll worry about it in the next event. Data security is going to be everything because now the events went from being in person and we had to worry about physical security. Now you need to bring that same level of security to your virtual events and your digital events as well. All right. That's my main trends. I can talk way too much. So I'd love to do some Q&A with you guys. So... Maybe if I'm allowed to, am I allowed to do some Q&A? Do we have a little bit of time left for some Q&A? Um, Will, lots of love coming in for our Glissa Q&A, first of all. Um, somebody's saying, just like to say how much I love listening to Will Curran, so knowledgeable. Thank you, Will. People don't want to hear it, but we can't rush this, and listening to scientists is what we need. Um, people agreeing with what you've been saying. One question that has come in, which has really perked, uh, piqued my interest, um, relates to speaker management. Somebody is posted, mm. speaker management is extremely difficult right now. How can we ensure that our speakers are confident and how many rehearsals should we be willing to hold with our speakers? If you have over 100 speakers, then rehearsals can take up a lot of time. I want to hear from you first of all on that, and then I've got something to throw in the mix as well. Definitely. I think that um, it can be really difficult right now, yeah. The budget to be able to set up an AV team for a week ahead of time, go through all the presentations. Like, we had to do that with this event, obviously, right? Like, we went sure and tech-checked every single person. And, you know, talk about, like, I did an event last week. It had, like, over, like, 1,600 sessions. It would have been impossible to do that. So one thing I think that you have to think about when it comes to your content is that if you're worried that your speakers are not tech savvy, consider options like on-demand or pre-recording sessions and playing back that presentation and then having them just come up on Q&A. Um, to just leave it for, so you don't have to worry about things like controlling the slide remotely, um, what if their slides aren't prepared properly, all that sort of stuff kind of goes out the window. So consider potentially doing pre-records. It's the first tip I have for you. Second thing I think when it comes to rehearsals is do as many as you need to. This is going to get expensive, right? Like talk about that when we talk about we're going to be spending more money for speakers who know what they're doing or we're going to be paying for it in terms of speaker management. So be ready potentially for that increased budget that before speaker management meant getting a speaker ready room, putting some water bottles in that room and maybe setting up a laptop and projecting from the test, right? And maybe having a couple of floaters across the AV rooms. Well, now you need to have a technician in every single room, someone who can talk through the technical issues, but also as well, I think the tech team needs to be prepared to also help solve non-AV broadcast related questions. Like, what if my PowerPoint's not working? My computer's acting slow, troubleshooting internet. The job of the, 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 the technician for events is going to be growing so rapidly in terms of skill set. So I think you also have to be prepared for that. Um, and then I think the last thing is to treat it like a customer experience. The same way you want your attendees to have an office experience, give that to the speakers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
I think that it would be great to know who posted this question because I'd love to be able to sort of respond to them in a, in a personal way. But I think this might be a great opportunity to maybe say to that person and give them a bit of insight into how we've done it ourselves because this is our first virtual Event Tech Live, you know, so we've gone through everything that this person's asked in their question, speaker management, how to sort out rehearsals, and just to give everybody a bit of insight who's tuning in. The other stage content was rehearsed and recorded two weeks ago. Last week, from Monday to Friday, we had nine rehearsal slots every day for the full week with all of our panelists and all of our speakers. Some of the panel sessions, understandably, you can't necessarily get four panelists together at the same time for a rehearsal. So you have to do those individually and then go with it on the day. You know that there are still things that you have to deal with on the fly and there is that challenge, but we've just spent the last two weeks doing those full rehearsals every day from nine o'clock in the morning till 6 p.m. in the evening. Um, but for both stages, rehearsing and recording content. So it is a challenge. We, we're fortunate that we've had some great tools um, to work with. We've had the guys at Line Up Ninja been giving us some great support in terms of managing all of that sort of stuff and um, using simple tools that are available like, like Google Calendar. You know, some of the Google applications and the platforms now are absolutely fantastic. We do have great tech available to us wonderful and it's on showcase this week but never forget that there are some simple tools that might do the job that you need um, to do when you're organizing stuff like speaker management definitely i'll, I'll tack on let's that go too, back while, to uh, go on. oh god go ahead go ahead james <laughs> i was just going to say we, we, we've got a number of questions on this that i'm really keen to sort of thrash through before before we lose you this let's evening do um, Let's do it. How will VR be a solution when we are in a hybrid environment? environment? Shouldn't we yeah, be looking at I, augmented reality? Yeah, augmented will be great. Um, I think augmented is ultimately the true future of where we're going to go. Um, when I see it working within a virtual standpoint, I can see things like, for example, 360 cameras being really popular. Um, so then that way, if someone wants to sit in a session and kind of look around, that would be great. Um, I can also see, but I think we've always talked about this when it comes to VR as a trend. I don't think VR happening at an event is really a trend. Like no one wants to like attend an event, especially now they're going to want to attend an event and then just close themselves off to the world. Right. They're going to want to embrace it. So I think like at events, AR will be the big thing, but I think that people from externally, virtually, your virtual audience coming in virtually will be done in VR will be really huge. Um, I think that sometimes while as much as like my belief is that virtual and hybrid is the pure melding of the two, when the, the in-person person has the same experience level that the person virtually has, and it's not like a fly on the wall scenario, I think that at some point too, you might also have to have these branches off, that there's a the in-person people might get to go to a party and that's their kind of like fun thing that they only get to do in person. But then the virtual audience gets this bonus thing and maybe that's the VR experience that comes along as well. Um, again, I think more headsets need to be in people's homes. I think um, um, the development costs need to be dropped down significantly. And, but I think for things like, for example, um, 20 person meetings, all sitting in a boardroom having a meeting, I don't think there's any reason why VR wouldn't be a total option for them, so. Hmm, absolutely. Um, ben Wasserman um, has got in touch with us. Ben, sending out uh, expensive screens to delegates is only attainable for those high-level conferences. Surely there are more cost-viable solutions with platforms that already offer whiteboard solutions, Zoom APIs, etc., that can be integrated with virtual platforms. What's your uh, take on that one? Yeah, so I think this is where we're also going to see that things like co-working spaces and um, small meeting spaces are also going to thrive. That before, um, if you want to have a little small ballroom in a hotel, there, you'd have to get all the AV separately and everything like that. So if it's too expensive for you to buy and give it delegates, what if instead you could say, you know, we've always talked about hub and spoke model, um, which if you just Google hub and spoke uh, events, um, you'll find some more information on that. We did a whole uh, article all about that. Um, but I think that when it comes to it, you can also have this option to say something like, hey, we got you a, um, a temporary membership at WeWork. There's a whiteboard in there, and that's going to have the digital drawing experience. 
just type in this URL and boom, you'll be able to obtain it in that way. Um, so maybe like sending it actually does. It. I'm thinking like right now we're like, we're all on true lockdown um, and how we like can't leave our homes. But if we have the ability to start going to WeWorks and other co-working spaces, I think co-working spaces have the opportunity to gain more revenue for like, hey, come rent a, a, an office for a day to attend your virtual event. It has a whiteboard, it has a webcam all those things like that. I think that could be super duper helpful. Um, and then I think the other thing is too, it's like, right, I'm talking about this 55 inch drawing display with a webcam. I don't have it right now, it's in the kitchen, but everybody has an iPad these days. Everybody has a, uh, you know, a, a Surface Pro laptop that you can draw on. Why are we not designing experiences that utilize that touch experience more? Again, I think a lot of these platforms are going to start to develop that and be able to do that more. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think that I'm not saying that everyone needs to order a $3,000 display, but if you compare like a, a Vibe uh, $3,000 display to a Surface Hub, which is $10,000, the costs are driving down dramatically. And I think that over this next year, we're going to see that maybe the $1,500 display comes out. Mm. Uh, just a quick shout out to Nicole Peck. Uh, Nicole Peck was responsible for our AR VR question. So hello to Nicole. And thanks for getting back Hi, in Nicole. touch to, to give us your name and basically getting a, a completely nameless name check live on Event Tech Live. <laughs> Um, Jonathan at Research Club gets in touch. How do you make networking really rock in virtual? Now, this is something that's been addressed on a couple of our sessions, I think, already today. But um, what's your take on really making that networking and that interaction between people work in a, in a virtual uh, environment? Yeah, I think the first thing is the, like a huge strategy that you can implement when it comes to this is not relying just on the platform or the organized event to do the actual like networking. So I'll give you a great example of this. Um, Twitter doesn't set out to say we're going to have people network. But for example, Adam Perry and I met on Twitter and then decided to meet up in a, a separate context, right? I think we ended up, I think a meeting in person was the first time that we met um, at a, at a, oh my gosh, I'm totally forgetting the name of the conference, but <laughs> we decided to meet up at the conference. So I think what it makes sense is for us to do is that you can use the platform to start the connection and then encourage this, cre this uh, you know, networking and true deep relationship outside your platform as well. This also solves a big problem that we run into, which is that right now there's no true platform that allows you to put like 50 people on screen to all talk to each other and unmute and mute and things like that because like a lot of web uh, uh, web uh, browsers can't handle that. Um, Zoom can do it because it's its own app, but browsers can't do it. And so this also fixes a problem that allows people to say, hey, let me try to maybe move this outside of outside of the platform. The one problem that we'll run into as an industry is how do we then track that? We just went from having very little ability to track things like interaction networking outside of our conference centers and you know, things like that to now we can track everything on our platforms, but how can we continue to track that um, engagement and that um, networking when it happens outside the platform? Classic problem that we always run into, but I think that's a strategy to go with it is to think not just happening inside your platform, not just a happy hour that you provide, not just a matchmaking system that provides, but instead, how can we make it so then that way we start the conversation and then the attendee can continue it. Mm, absolutely. We've got time for a, a couple more, I think. Um, let's try and squeeze these in, Will. Um, audiences seem to be getting wise to on-demand provision impacting live virtual attendance. Do you recommend on-demand as a value add, or does it detract more than it actually adds? Great question. I think it depends on your audience. Um, so one of the strategic things I talk about in trend, the trends presentation usually is build out your buyer personas. So like your attendee personas, you should know everything about your attendees and all the stuff that goes into it. We, I think that if you're asking me that question, for some people, it might make sense. So for example, I, I did a medical conference. Doctors are really busy. They're trying to squeeze as much time into it as possible. They love on demand because they can get snippets here and there versus sit down and get the attention. Tech, on the other hand, I can tell you all the time that if you told me, hey, come to this conference, sit down for eight hours, I might be like, yeah, I'll totally be there. And then I'm like, I have to get it right then and there because next week it's irrelevant. It's not important anymore, right? I got to get it while it's yeah. fresh and while it's hot and while it's relevant, right? So when I think about it, I definitely think on-demand should always be some sort of value-add uh, 
a potential for revenue. There's no reason why I think that you can have like a, a live ticket why, and then say like, hey, for an extra 10 bucks, get access to all of our content. A, it covers all your, your um, bandwidth costs then at that point, but you might also be able to turn into an additional revenue source. But what I love about on demand is that for things that like last year and have a good long shelf, shelf value, it enables me to have an ongoing training like Udemy kind of like course available to me, which is really exciting. So I definitely think that there's so much potential, but yes, too much content can also be a bad thing as well. Mm. Something that I raised um, with the team here last week, um, looking at what we were going to push out this week, is that as a result of this week and by the end of this week, we're going to have more content delivered by event tech professionals than we've ever had before after the end of a, at the end of a single show. And for us, that, that, that could be really, really valuable when we go back into the real life events arena. You know, we, we've got stuff that you, doesn't just has to be, have to be played over an internet connection. You know, we've got video conferences that we could put on a big screen at an event during a session break. You know, we've got a wealth of content and a bank of content that we could drive out there constantly now for, 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 for the next couple of years, um, both online and in real life. And, and I think that's take is on that but I think that there's a real opportunity through virtual events to actually build up a really good catalog of material that we can also still utilize when we get back into the live arena definitely and I think a pro tip I would add into that too is that you need to be considering repurposing your content too right we have this huge database of content yeah you can just push it onto a, a video library watch it when you want sort of thing but instead what you should be doing too is giving it to a video editor and saying Get the best clips of everything. Grab the most quotable thing that Will said in his keynote. Chop up, get three of the things on us. Boom, you got three social media posts right there. Best part is now you can chop that content up using on social media to promote next year. So not only do you have your social media calendar now taken care of with all this recorded content, but you also now have the ability to uh, turn it into an on-demand library for potential revenue sources. It's just so awesome because before to do this with in-person, you had to stick a camera, you had to audio operator, you know, you had to handle all the files, you know, everything's recorded now that we're doing everything virtually and repurposing. Mm, absolutely. Well, we are getting pushed for time here and we're going to need to start wrapping things up. But I would say to everybody who's tuned into this uh, session today, we've had loads of questions come in on Glesser. I apologize that we can't get around to them all. But again, I would urge people to do what I've said at several points today is get on to the virtual event platform, connect with any of the speakers that you've heard today. Will's going to be on there. You know, all of our other speakers, our panelists, our exhibitors. If you want to get involved with anybody that's related to Event Tech Live this year, you can do so via the virtual events platform. Please take the opportunity to do that. Keep your social media posts coming in. Use hashtag ETL20 to do so. Tell us what you've thought of today. We'd love to get your feedback. You know, it's important that we get that. Any event thrives off the feedback that it receives. Um, and we would look forward to, to receiving that this year as much as any year. Our thanks to Will Curran from Endless Events for looking at some of the virtual events trends. Will, great to see you again, my friend. Great to see you, James. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. I love finally get to hang out with you guys. And uh, uh, thank you to the audience for all tuning in. And uh, I'll see you guys on the platform and also see you guys on social. And uh, hopefully see you all around real soon.